Hello everyone, welcome back to the Echelon Hub YouTube channel. Today I'm going solo. It's the Cunning Quick Step Day. Today is Sunday and we needed a specific video just for this team. Uh, every year, pretty much the same. We see pure obliteration in the classics. Well, now not anymore. Tons and tons of stages, tons of classics. Uh, now even the Grand Tours contenders are coming along, even though they are extremely young, brutal talents. There's just um, there's a lot to talk about in this team. There is a whole lot. Uh, where do we even start? We're gonna we're gonna start with the world champion, uh, Julian Alaphilippe, 28 years old. Uh, he didn't have as brilliant of a season as he would have hoped for, of course, with the Liège incident being pretty much the headliner of uh, his season except for the World Championships. I reckon that is when they <coughs> really uh, made his season, pretty much. After 2019, that was almost impossible to replicate. I think that this was the only way that he could really make it up for it. Uh, I don't think that he's gonna um, that he's gonna target any Grand Tour uh, for the overall contention. Of course, I think that he, he even tried it last year, <coughs> but um, he's far from a pure climber, far from a rider that can really um, fly in those long mountain alpine stages and at altitude as well. Uh, but the fact that he focuses every year on the Ardennes, and rightfully so, makes it a little hard for him to target any of the other Grand Tours. He's also French, of course, and as the world champion, it's almost a guarantee that he's going to be at the Tour. Uh, the Tour is going to have a lot of time trialing kilometers, and despite him being a, a solid, good time trialist, uh, I wouldn't expect him at all to be to even try to be in the overall contention. I think that the uh, netting stages maybe the KOM jersey as well as in 2017 or 18 now I'm not sure would be uh, his best chance for success there personally I would love if he would go to the Vuelta but um, I think the Olympics are also in his plan so uh, the usual Milano San Remo and Ardennes in the beginning of the season tour for stages uh, Olympics and then the the worlds don't suit him as well in this year in Leuven Belgium uh, but for sure he's going to be there, and as a, a strong candidate, nothing against him. Uh, but I wouldn't see him taking a second title in a row, like uh, Sagan did back some years ago. But uh, I definitely expect some big things. He is still incredibly talented, and uh, he is in the right team for it. I expect to see Dries Devon, especially, being everywhere he goes, pretty much. Mikel Honore, also a very, very good rider, that is... Uh, really coming along nicely as a puncher, and uh, then just a, a lot of talents, you know, riders like Mattia Cataneo, Andrea Baggioli, uh, they can really do very, very well in those classics. There's a lot of climbers like Magnada and Almeida, which of course can also uh, really help uh, in those that are less sharp, where there's a lot of climbing involved. Uh, mentioning João Almeida, obviously that is the second name that we're going to go through. Uh, one of the biggest surprises of the season, and you know, it's even hard for me to really call it a surprise, seeing that he is, um, he is a rider that I have raced with myself back when I was a junior. Uh, he was in the last year as a junior, and already at the time he was a massive winner here in Portugal. He was absolutely flying anywhere he would go. He went to race in... Uh, Uni Euro, uh, Bulgarian Italian team, if I'm not mistaken, uh, when we was only 18, I think, and then went on to Axion, and I was surprised with how quickly he adapted to the World Tour level. Uh, already in the the, the Tour of Algarve, uh, I think he finished 10 for something while supporting Evan Paul the whole way. It was absolutely incredible. But uh <coughs> even though I knew that he was a a very, very good and promising stage racer uh, back when I saw him in Utah, if I'm not mistaken, where uh, alongside the likes of Ben Ehrmans and James Pickle, I think he finished third or fourth in the overall, and he was improving every day, even whilst at altitude, which is something that definitely is not uh, something that's really present here in Portugal. And personally, I can say that the place where he lives, or used to live, also is not at all at altitude. 
Uh, his performance in the Giro was absolutely amazing. Uh, as a Portuguese, I must say that I'm absolutely thrilled for having a talent like him, 22 years old only, already in the dispute of some of the biggest races in the world. I think it's absolutely amazing. I expect to see a whole lot of him for the next few years. 2021 specifically, uh, the plan this year was to be at the Giro with Evan Paul, the team developing its uh, young stage racers. So I wouldn't be surprised if next year you would do the same. Uh, but seeing how the tour is um, formed, uh, its route, uh, we know that Evan Paul is not going to go to the tour, even though that, uh, in theory, if he can hold, hold on for the three weeks, it would suit him very well. It has a lot of time trialing kilometers. Uh, Almeida equally rides strong in those individual challenges. <coughs> and uh, with the Giro under his belt, I think that the tour would be a logical good step to take. Uh, Sam Bennett is probably going to be there, Alaphilippe as well, the team is certainly going to contest stages as it normally does, but I don't believe that Almeida properly needs a team around him since uh, Ineos and Yumbo especially are sure to be controlling the whole race in the mountains pretty much and Almeida is a big engine. Um, he's also not a big name, so he's not someone who's going to be marked and uh, he's someone that is very suited to the to the racing style that uh, Yambo this year implemented, for example. So I would love to see him at the Tour, focus on some week-long stage races in the beginning of the season. Uh, he's also really well suited to classics. There's, there's a whole lot that he can do. I love seeing him racing. He can even sprint very well. I am really excited for what's to come of him this season. I really am. And uh, as I've touched before, uh, Remco Evenpol is going to be at the Giro. Now, that is no surprise. He was supposed to be there this year, and uh, he wasn't because of the crash. Uh, the first question really is if he has recovered from his rather serious crash. I would like to believe so. I have seen uh, a lot of riders recover recently from injuries similar to his. He's quite young. I would believe that he is capable of doing so. Um, for the sake of this um, argument, of course, I'm going to assume that he will be fully recovered and it is best. He's going to target the Giro for sure. Can he handle the three weeks? That is a question that we really don't know uh, until we see it, until we get to those final days of the Giro, uh, if he indeed makes it there. Uh, I'm proper excited to see as well how he will race. It is very refreshing to see a rider like him with a massive engine, with a solid, very strong time trialist, not a sharp rider, you know, the the perfect image pretty much of a rider who uh, won't be aggressive, but he is exactly the opposite. He still races like a junior, but he has managed to bring in that dominance from his junior years onto the elites straight. That is absolutely incredible. Rightfully so is he touted perhaps the biggest talent of this generation and that is saying a lot comparing him to riders like Pogacar and Bernal who have already won the Tour de France at ages of 21 and 22 if I'm not mistaken. Um, and Van Poel can pretty much win wherever he wants. Uh, we never saw him at the Grand Tour so I can't say if that is perhaps uh, a bad side of him. He needs to fully prepare and fully focus on the Giro and perhaps not be as focused in winning in previous races, not take that form up to its absolute highest level beforehand, which can be uh, dangerous then, taking it to the Grand Tours. Uh, I would still believe he is going to win big time before tackling the Giro, where he's going to be for sure one of the main contenders, for sure one of the riders the man to beat. Uh, but the first week says it all, pretty much. The first week says it all. Will he make it there? Um, in pink, that is one question. And uh, the other is, how can he survive the high mountains, the altitude, and the, the, the endurance, the recovery of those, those three weeks? So, uh, about the climber side of the team, this is pretty much all done. There are some more interesting riders, like James Knox and Fausto Maginada. Uh, some developing riders as well, like Andrea Vaggioli, which I would really like to see how he develops. He's more of a puncher, can sprint. 
uh, but I reckon that for the high mountains he also has a good future but uh, it's still early still early for him so we're ready to talk about that the next fuel that I'm gonna approach is the classics of course the cunning used to be the dominant team not anymore I would say with the rise of Wout van Aert and Matthew van der Poel onto the road ranks it's rather hard and um, this last season there was a very uh, special Tour de Flanders the team has four riders that I would consider cobbled specialists that are strong enough to take monuments those are Kaspar Asgreen, Yves Lampard, Zdenek Stivar and Florian Seneschal I would reckon that all those four riders could for example in theory win a Paris-Roubaix uh, they have a whole lot of riders that could also thrive in those cobble races like Davide Ballerini, like Remy Cavagna, Bert, uh, Bert van Lerberg, Stein Steels, the big tractor Tim de Klerk, Ilio Kaisa. You know, they're just everywhere. They're everywhere in the team. The team is absolutely stacked with riders perfect for these kind of races. But none of those were the men that really... Uh, yeah, uh, they were not the riders that were able to contest the Tour de Flanders. Uh, Julian Alaphilippe was. Now, with the difference in calendar from last season to this season, I wouldn't expect to see Alaphilippe in the battle for the win of those Cobalt Classics. I, I, mean I don't think that he's going to be there. If he is there, however, I would absolutely love to see him have a rematch, pretty much. And uh, one of the questions that I've been asking the most in the last few videos was exactly how do you beat Wout van Aert and Matthew van der Poel at this point? And uh, some of the answers given were um, you just have to go kamikaze from very, very early on. Uh, I've debated that that is van der Poel's strategy actually. And he does that on purpose to destroy and deorganize teams like the Cunning. The other, which I have proposed mostly, is that you just have to follow them as much as possible. And the uh, hope for an opportunity, uh, the same as Mads Persson won Gent Wevelgem. That sort of opportunity is what uh, the teams need to beat those two. Because it's not just one rider, it's two. You can't dispatch one and just carry the other. They both sprint like no other classics rider pretty much, except for maybe Sagan. And uh, the Koenig have a lot of strength in numbers. You know, you have teams like AG2R, Bora, which uh, we've discussed already. Uh, having big numbers for the season. The Koenig is another one of them. I would say that with Kaspar Asgren, Yves Lampard, Zdenek Stivar and Florian Seneschal, they have to keep up the maximum. They have, uh, one of them has to attack ev very, very early on. The team has to be very aggressive. They can't control the race anymore like they always used to. Seeing them win Flanders, it's a big question because then there are a whole lot more contenders and I would put for example, Alberto Vettiol, Oliver Nysen, Greg Van Avermaet. Um, more names that we're going to approach in the next few videos. They are very strong. Uh, Jasper Stuyven and Mads Patterson, of course. Uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about those names in the next few videos, of course. I think that seeing Flanders come for the Cunning this year is going to be very, very hard. Uh, but on the opposite side, I would say that Roubaix... Uh, Rouvet is going to be a very, very proper suiting classic for Van Aert. For Van Der Poel as well, but uh, Van Aert I would say more. Uh, but that is a classic where the Finn riders, you know, the likes of Hal Philippe, um, he or she, Valens, uh, Cosnef Roy, for example, some of the riders that we've been seeing riding very, very well on the cobblestones, but on the hilly classic, uh, on the hilly classics with cobblestones, they are... Uh, Definitely not riders very suited for Roubaix, I would say. In Roubaix, you need the pure power. You need to have the weight. You know, the more weight you have, the less vibrations you will feel. It's perfect for heavy riders. And, you know, you see the likes of Matty Heyman, Sylvain Dillier, who have achieved massive uh, career highlight results in Paris-Roubaix. And that is exactly because they they have the physical capabilities for it. And I would never expect to see Julian Alaphilippe doing the same. I would also say because he's been touted as one of the biggest contenders for it for the future. And uh, as an under-23 Paris winner, Tom Pitcock, 
uh, a writer that I've interviewed, actually, one of the nicest guys that uh, I could really expect. I would never see him winning Paris-Roubaix in the Elite because he's just... Uh, he is not heavy enough for it, I would say. <laughs> Cycling has a long tradition of you're too heavy to win this, but uh, in Paris-Roubaix it's the opposite. You're not heavy enough to win this. And I stick to that. I stick to that very firmly when it comes to Roubaix, perhaps the only uh, race of the season where that theory <laughs> is employed by me and I'm sure many other people. Uh, I would expect to see the Koenig win Roubaix much more easily. Uh, I think that Florian Seneschal can definitely do something this season. He is the classics rider that I'm really hoping to to see shining this year. Team obviously has a lot of big names to do so. Uh, Lampard is is probably in his career peak. I would say he's 29, and uh, Seneschal and Asgreen, those are my two cards for Rubé. If the Cunning is to play one. Now, obviously, we're going to go on to the sprints afterwards. The first question, obviously, which is very important uh, about Fabio Jakobsen. Just the fact that Fabio Jakobsen is back on his bike is already something that I am very content with, especially as a person who was watching the Tour of Poland stage live. It's it's something that is it's it makes me happy. It makes me happy to see that he's okay. He's recovered uh, within possibilities, of course. The first question is, can he race again? Can he race competitively again? And uh, I think that I don't have a, a proper answer for that. I think perhaps the only person that does is him. I personally won't put any expectations in him. Uh, the only thing that I really want is for him to recover fully from his injuries. Uh, looking at what um, I've been reading in the, the last few weeks, I'm, I'm happy, I'm positive that that will happen. Uh, I'm not sure at the same time if I want to see him race again. You know, it's, it's, it's got to be such a traumatic experience to go through what he went through. And uh, seeing him race again will not only trigger back those memories for all cycling fans I would reckon it um, it would also make me somewhat scared uh, because it was a it was a it was a big moment and uh, seeing him race again I do want that at the same time because it's it's the proof of his recovery it's the showing that he's got the strength to do it um, but yeah I hope above all health secondly racing that's that's my opinion on it uh the remainder sprinters of the team you know obviously there's there's some very interesting names like davide valerini which can do so so well he's such an underrated rider and uh, someone like yannick steimel who is showing his true colors as well he has done so in the vuelta uh in 2019 he also won a belgium classic uh, I don't remember its name now, but he's done really good. He's a rider that I follow very closely, and I'm really excited to see what he can do in the future. Uh, secondly, you have Alvaro Hodek, which uh, I have discussed some weeks ago on Twitter with someone. And uh, I really don't see Hodek staying in the team for another year. He's a solid sprinter, but it doesn't seem like he's evoluted since he came on to the, to the Koenig team. He's finished on a podium in the Giro. Uh, he has a couple podium places as well in the Volta San Juan and the Tour of Colombia early in the year, but he's gotten no wins, and he's actually got uh, he's actually gotten a whole lot of opportunities, uh, especially in the Giro where the sprint contingent wasn't as strong. You know, I would never expect him to have beaten Demar with the power that he was having, but uh, he didn't even finish in the second place, which for me would have been much easier, much more. Um, much more proper, I would say. Uh, it really, it really strikes a question to where he's gonna stay in the team. I think that Jakobsen has a very good lead out with him. He had Seneschal and Van Leberg, if I'm not mistaken, which were the riders that uh, usually stayed with him. 
and uh, you have Sam Bennett, obviously, which has the single best lead out that you could imagine with Michael Morkov, with Shane Archful, with, you know, at the Vuelta, it was just an absolutely insane lead out. And not only in the Vuelta, of course, you have riders like Evelyn Parks, Remy Cavagna, just absolute trains to lead them out. M many more throughout the team, and one more coming in with Joseph Cerny. Um, Sam Bennett is the last sprinter. I think that he's going to be at the tour defending his green jersey. It was an absolutely incredible achievement that he's done to overcome Peter Sagan. And in the way he did it, you know, at the time, some could have reckoned it as, you know, dirty, dirty work. Uh, you know, having Bennett and Bora, <coughs> uh, Bennett and the Cunning, pardon, uh, covering all the moves from Sagan, all the moves from Bora. Some may have put it as dirty racing I put it as really exciting it gave the tour it gave two or three stages of the tour a whole lot more excitement than expected it was uh, it was really a very good race and it wasn't just a race for the yellow jersey you could see it was a pure race for the green jersey a lot a big subplot going in there Sagan not only did he have a massive battle he lost the battle and Bennett absolutely deserved that green jersey that he's gotten without a doubt I think he will be back this year for more uh, I don't have the route memorized in my head right now but I believe that there would be more bunch sprint finishes this year so there is a legitimate chance that he may take another one uh, if he isn't overtaken by the likes of Caleb Ewan of possibly Dylan Rundwagen um, Arno de Mar, of course, uh, if they don't come around and steal many of the points that will be available at the bunch sprints, I think that Sagan is going to have yet another very, very difficult battle to take back the green jersey, uh, an eighth green jersey, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, that is what I expect from Dylan Rundwagen, with the likes of Mikhail Murkov and the whole team of locomotives that follow behind him. Uh, I think he's just perfectly set. I think that there is no weak spot in his armor. There is no weak spot in the team's armor. I expect to see him win a lot and uh, repeat the features that um, he's had this year. Yes, I don't expect him to, uh, to come any less shy of results. Final question, obviously, Mark Cavendish. <laughs> you know, at the time, you know, at this moment, it's not such a hotly debated subject. But I think my opinion is shared by most of you out there when you say that um, I don't expect anything from Mark Cavendish, honestly. I think that racing in the Koenig, having pretty much the best infrastructure and a very good bike, is certainly going to see him, a and motivation above all, because clearly he is very motivated to ride back in the Koenig. I have no doubt about that. I don't expect him doing any results. I am aware that he's more for the marketing and uh, a lot for the image, which I cannot blame. You know, the Koenig wins, he wins. The place that he took in the team wasn't going to be taken by any other rider. Uh, I believe that he joined the team with some sponsor coming in at the same time. So he's not stealing the place of an upcoming young talent or a rider that is left without a contract after the last season he's not so I have nothing to criticize him for I have nothing to criticize the team for the decision of getting him and to be honest I am quite excited to see what he's able to do because obviously he's not at the same level that he's been in previous years and I don't think that anyone would expect him to be uh, but as I said, with the best infrastructure, with the best bike, I uh, am really excited to see what level it truly is. Because I don't believe that in Bahrain we really saw it. You know, I think in the last months we saw Cavendish more, you know, he wasn't getting the results, but he was there. He was there. You know, for a year or two, he couldn't even keep up with the peloton. He couldn't even do things. And... Now in this last classics block of racing uh, in Belgium, we even saw him in the breakaway of Ghent Bevelgam on uh, Scheldebris. And um, I saw him stick around in the peloton until the finish sometimes. I want him to, to be up there. I want him to be up there in some races. I want to see the best of what he's able to do at this moment. And uh, I, r I really wish him all the best. 
I'm not expecting any results, but um, I will be very interested to see what he can do this season. Uh, whether that be sprinting, whether that be performing lead-out duties, whether that be even chasing the breakaway all day. Anything that comes, I will be watching him, and I will be hoping for the best of him. So I'm going to go on to my final question, which is uh, something that I've been doing in the last few videos, rightfully so, but uh, a little bigger this time. One rider that I expect to surprise this season, and one rider that uh, I expect to uh, flop this season, to not have the performances that are expected of him. And uh, I just have to have another little look at the team, to be honest, because there's so many riders that fit in all of these spaces. And to be honest, if I said only one name, it really wouldn't be a proper answer. Because to be honest, there are a whole lot of riders in here that I expect to really break through this year, like Andrea Bagioli, like Yannick Steimler. Uh, but my answer would really be Florian Seneschal. He's been developing very, very well. He was my call to win Roubaix this year if he had... Uh, he and any other rider would have been at the start. He is a local to those roads. He is very motivated to tackle that race. He has a massively strong team that can race in his support. He's very sharp. He's a very powerful rider. I, I have him as a big favorite to win Paris-Roubaix, to be honest. If he can contend with the likes of Van, of Van Aert and Van Der Poel directly, it's a very hard call. But experience, opportunity and good luck all have a very big role to play in that race. So yes, I would expect to see him as one of the biggest challengers for um, both Van Der Poel and Van Aert. And if I were to, you know, there's obviously many names in here, like João Almeida, who, whom I expect a lot from. But he is already performing so, so well that I wouldn't consider him even a surprise being on the podium of Grand Tour. The biggest disappointment of the season, however, in another side, is an equally hard question. And my first lean is towards Alvaro Hodeg, uh, Alvaro Hodge. I have said Hodak several times in this video, I am absolutely sure, but only now that I remember that it's pronounced Hodge. So it is hard to s it's it's hard for me to say because you have Hodge, you have Cavendish of course, uh, and then you have some more riders that in theory could get some good results or have a very big name. But I wouldn't go through them. I wouldn't go through them because I don't expect, to be honestly, great results from them from the start. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I sound like I'm kind of contradicting from my previous videos, especially my uh, EF one, where it was uh, Will Barta that I've said I wasn't expecting much from him, but that is because he was being massively overhyped. I keep that opinion, yes. I would say that maybe Zdenek Stivar is the rider that I would expect to to see less this season than usual. He's a great rider. I really like him. I I don't remember seeing him this season, to be honest. I see that he has some results here, but see, his his classics campaign, you know, obviously it was a very shortened classics campaign and the lockdown could have also played a role in here. Uh, I don't remember if he's had any injuries, but um, I see consistent racing from him, so I wouldn't be expecting that. Of course, the lockdown could have had uh, uh, an effect on his form, but honestly, I was expecting a whole lot more from him. I don't even remember seeing him. Uh, there's a stage result here in one of the Vuelta Espana stages, but obvious, but it's also nothing that really stands up to me. So he still has a big name, you know. At this point, he's already 35. 
I think that he's beginning to decline. I think he's had his best years. I hate the fact that he never managed to win a monument. He's been very close. Uh, but I think he's still going to be a very important rider for the Classics block, I would say. Uh, he's going to be a, a, an important card for the team. But uh, I don't expect him to, to win again in the Classics. I don't expect him to be in the contention for the win because there are so many big names arising in the cunning so it's a little bit of a shame for me to say it but uh, the purpose of this question really is to make it hard to make a uh, to make a, a hard and uh, sometimes even <laughs> for ourselves to really make that decision because Steve R is a writer that I personally love throughout the years but I don't see him uh, getting back to that level anymore that is what I have for today. I hope that you enjoyed this video. The next episode is going to be... Um, who is going to be the next episode with? I don't even remember. It's going to be with Kurpama, FDJ, and um, Intermarché Gobert. <laughs> there is Ineos also, of course, but... Um, the order in which I'm going to do them, I don't know, but Ineos themselves deserve, as Quickstep does, a whole video for themselves so Groupama, Intermarché, maybe the next video then Ineos, maybe the order will be a different one that really doesn't matter what matters is if you enjoyed this video leave a like, subscribe stay tuned for the next video I'm going to be doing a review of all of the teams in the World Tour for this season with guests at some or most of the videos so again 